Hey, I'm Rob Woodger from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to business continuity management in Domain 3 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the seventh of seven videos for Domain 3. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a minuscule part of our complete CCSP masterclass. Business continuity management is the business process that drives the planning and preparation for disasters by conducting the business impact analysis process, the BIA, and then using the results of the BIA, the measurements of time, RPO, RTO, WRT, and MTD to create, test, train people for, and maintain business continuity plans, BCPs, and disaster recovery plans, DRPs. The point of all of this planning, preparation, and training within business continuity management is to ensure that critical processes and systems continue to operate during a disaster to ensure the survival of the business. The first major process we perform in business continuity management is the business impact assessment. The major output of the BIA process is four different measurements of time that have been approved by the process or system owners. The owner must approve these numbers, these measurements of time, because ultimately the owner must pay for the costs associated with achieving these numbers. And let me reemphasize each of these numbers are measurements of time, seconds, minutes, hours, days. The recovery point objective is a measurement of how much data an organization is willing to lose as a result of a disaster. So if the server explodes, what is the maximum tolerable data loss as a measurement of time? Five seconds worth of data, 10 minutes worth of data, three hours, two days worth of data. What's the maximum amount of data that the organization is willing to lose as a measurement of time? The recovery time objective, recovery time, the RTO, is a measurement of the maximum tolerable time to recover systems to a predefined service level. Typically, this means how long does it take to bring a system back online? The work recovery time, the WRT, is the maximum tolerable amount of time to verify systems and data integrity as part of returning systems to normal operations. And the maximum tolerable downtime, the MTD, also sometimes referred to as the maximum allowable downtime, MAD, is the maximum time a critical process or system can be disrupted before there are unacceptable consequences to the business. The MTD is always going to be greater than or equal to RTO plus WRT. Now, let's talk about two major types of plans that these numbers derive the creation of. Business continuity plans, BCPs, focus on critical business processes. For example, paying employees is typically considered to be a critical business process. So in the event of a disaster, like our automated payroll system blowing up, the BCP plan would focus on how to continue the business process of paying employees. BCP plans fo essentially focus on the survival of the business or business processes. Disaster recovery plans, DRPs, focus on the recovery of critical technology, infrastructure, and systems. So in the example of the payroll system exploding, while the BCP is focused on keeping the payroll business process running, the DRP would be focused on the recovery of the actual payroll system. Lots of organizations are now using the cloud as a major part of their recovery plans. The cloud can be an extremely cost-effective recovery option. You only pay for what you use. So you can have a bunch of virtual infrastructure prepared, but suspended, ready and waiting. And you can switch it on very quickly and only start paying once the infrastructure is up and running. So the cloud can provide a very flexible and cost-effective recovery option. Let's go through a few options of how to use the cloud for recovery. The first is to have your primary systems on premise and your recovery systems in the cloud. That would be recovery to the cloud. The next is recovery within the same cloud service provider. This, this second option is where you have your primary systems in the cloud and your backup systems will also be hosted within the same cloud service provider. If you choose this architecture, you'll wanna make sure that your backups, your recovery systems are held within a different availability zone so that a disaster doesn't take down both copies, both systems, hopefully. And the final option here, recovery to alternate CSP. This is where you keep your primary systems in one cloud service provider and your recovery systems in a separate cloud service provider's cloud. 
Under this setup, if a disaster takes down your primary provider, you can switch to the backup one. This is technically challenging to implement, but provides much better resiliency than recovery within the same cloud service provider. Now, it's important, right, to mention failures are going to happen. So it's important for us to design our architectures to handle failures gracefully. We need to architect for failure. Some of the most common techniques that we'd use to architect for failure include using cloud services with multiple availability zones, having backup services that are geographically remote, and having automatic failovers in place. This is the whole idea of architecting for failure. Chaos engineering is an approach that involves intentionally introducing faults into a system to test its resilience. In other words, intentionally knocking systems offline. By deliberately placing our systems under these stresses, we can test the stability under diverse conditions. When chaos engineering breaks something, this allows us to identify the weaknesses in our architectures, and we can improve systems to be more stable and resilient. Basically, the whole idea of chaos engineering is you intentionally and continually cause disasters in your infrastructure, and you learn quickly to build and operate resilient systems. This is often way more effective than testing a disaster recovery plan every few years. Vendor lock-in happens when it becomes too difficult or costly for you to switch your systems to another provider. It often happens if your provider doesn't use interoperable formats and if your systems aren't portable. Vendor lock-in can be a major challenge from a recovery perspective. If you are locked into a specific vendor and they go down, you may have limited to no options for recovery. You're entirely reliant on the provider to bring your systems back up hopefully in a timely manner. So you want to think very carefully about vendor lock-in from a resiliency perspective, business continuity management perspective. And there you go. That is an overview of business continuity management within domain three, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. Thank you.